much for inviting me. Um, it's a little bit of a digression from normal anterior segment stuff to take you to the land of history and things that have brought us thus far, because it's rather exciting to, be have, to have been in both the oldest eye hospitals, both at Morefields currently, and I studied at the Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, which had the first eye hospital as a medical student, and later on to do my postdoc as well. It's also interesting to note that although we might have belonged to the oldest eye hospital, a few other eye hospitals in India are also quite old, and the first old ones were seen both in Calcutta and in Bombay. So going back to the history a little bit while he finds my presentation, is the fact that um, long ago, 200 years ago, ophthalmology wasn't the most sought after specialty even in England. So. I'm going to take, sort of paint the picture to you, for you as to how ophthalmology was in, 18, in the 18th century and in the early 17th and 18th century. So thi this tells us a little bit about who was born at this particular time. You might recall John Ruskin, the novelist. It was also the same year that Queen Victoria and Prince Albert have also, were, were also born. But for us in the medical world, it was rather exciting because this dentist managed to give us ether and so brought us surgery that was painless. It was also the year where we lost James Watt and Daniel Rutherford as well. Now, Clara Schumann was a very beautiful composer and she made fantastic music, but she wasn't as well known as her husband, who's the Schumann we often recognize in the classical music world. So a forgotten woman in those days. So Europe at that time had a lot of things going on. And people from very small countries, as small as Portugal and Holland, came all the way sailing in ships to, this, to the eastern coast of India. This is the story of the East India Company. It almost beggars belief that somebody who formed a company could colonize an entire continent. And from some of it came good stuff, and some from some of it came very strange stuff, as we all know. So the East India Company was formed by some merchants who wanted to essentially trade along the Indian Ocean. They came when the Mughals were ruling India, and um, they also colonized, and they also had interests both in the East Indies and in China. Later on, as you know, they, there were so many difficulties with the East India Company. Queen Victoria likes to be remembered as the Empress of India, and she considered India the jewel in the crown for very many reasons, as we all know, from spice trade to the gems. So that was the only chap who was our friendly face, the chap who gave us ether. So when, this when the East India Company was first formed, we did a lot of trade in silk and spices, and they were all the beginnings of the British Empire. The Portuguese who came there traded, and they came earlier than the East India Company, the Dutch who came, who formed the United East India Company, also came earlier. And there was a very small French interest, which still continued to be there as Pondicherry for a very long time. And following the battles of Plassey and Baxa, you know, they established their power to an even greater degree. Madras is relatively new, as Chennai was originally called Madras in, the f in, in, in 1500. It was a very small place. But at the s currently, we know more fields as an eye hospital, which is quite big in the National Health Trust. And it's part of the UCL um, Institute of Ophthalmology, and it's part of that university. And it is the oldest and largest eye hospital in Europe. And in 1805, when Morefields was first established by John Cunningham Saunders, he was assisted by John Richard Farray. Apparently, he had to write a special note saying, I can't cope with all the patients with eye diseases, could you please find me an assistant? That's when John Richards joined. So it, was, it existed at a previous site, and it's been relocated to its current location. But it's also celebrated 200 years in 2005, which is a very big note. 
Currently, the statues of these two men are relegated to a small area because the space they existed in has been cleared to form yet another clinic. As you know, we're always running out of space and moving corridor space. So this was the founder of the Morphe's Eye Hospital a long time ago. And Travers was one of the ophthalmic surgeons there, and he worked for the East India Company. And uh, Richardson and Travers did early cataract surgery. We should also think of Saunders as quite an interesting character because he introduced dilation of the pupil so that we could operate in a much easier fashion. So he introduced belladonna, and thus pupils were dilated. So in the previous talk, we've been hearing of intracameral dilation. I think in these days, it was lucky that he could drop something on the corneal surface for dilation. He began his life uh, as a chap who was interested in trachoma, trying to treat all the people who were coming back from Egypt after the wars in about 1913. And that's how he became interested in ophthalmology and established the hospital at the time. They were ma basically hospitals for people returning from the wars. And the people in the, in the cities used it when they got into trouble. He also wrote a book it also helps us realize that ophthalmology wasn't a very paying profession because his poor widow had to survive on the you know, remuneration got from selling his book after he died. And following that, John Richards took over and he continued to work. But even in the very early days, Moorfields has been training a lot of pupils and has been training people who came from UK, India, Portugal, Germany, America, and also the Army and the Navy. The first people who operated, you know, did cataract surgery were trained in Moorfields and then went on to operate apparently in America because there was nobody else to do it there and they were scared to take that long, arduous journey, especially for their parents to come to England to be operated. Following that, in 10 years, more than 1,000 people were trained and they went away to practice ophthalmology in various corners of the world. And that was quite an interesting thing. Currently, we have a lot of trainees who go to other parts of the world, also in their thousands to come back and disseminate and practice ophthalmology. So it's rather an exciting time of understanding nursing, ophthalmology, and the way we sort of set about imparting things to our students and then taking it on and running forwards. That's a picture of Chennai along the coast and the eye hospital that was established there. Now, this too was established by the East India Company by, some, uh, by a person who came all the way from Richardson, who came from, who was a, you know, part of the East India Company, who came and opened this hospi hospital here for the army people who were in the cantonment areas in the Madras presidency at that time. And the G general hospital in Chennai, which is the government general hospital currently, and it looks like that now, existed for a very long time. It started in 1664. It also tells us how ophthalmology was neglected for such a long time as a particular specialty because it took them quite a long time to have an eye hospital or to have an eye department exclusively. That's Madras in the 1920s looking quite different than it, did, than it does now. So the start of the eye hospital in Madras was by Richardson and it, became, it was a Madras eye infirmary. It was renamed and the people who trained here also went on to train elsewhere. But following the success of the Madras Hospital, two more people came from England, both to Bombay and to Calcutta, to open these very old hospitals there as well. So I think that this hospital too is now affiliated to the Madras University, and it's called the Regional Institute of Ophthalmology now. And it too is a very big hospital, and it had a lot of beds in the old days, more than 1,000 beds. We, of course, have all limited our inpatient care now. And as the Madras Eye Hospital formed, it was run by a lot of people from British India, actually, who came across the seas. There were very few Indians at that time taken who were in charge of the hospital. So only following independence or near independence that, that the Indians took over. And the names who, you know, who were quite important were, you know, Elliot, who invented the sclerotrophining that we know quite well, and Coleman Nair who, and Mutaya, whose pictures still hang in the hallways and who were imp important because they even started the eye bank in India. But however, the rest of general medicine was progressing quite rapidly in 1664 at the government general hospital. So there was a lot of collaboration between the ophthalmologists and the uh, general doctors in the hospital. 
And the general hospital was apparently a really large hospital, and it too took care of the army corps at that time. Madras Medical College was founded in 1835, and it became part, you know, the, the eye hospital was affiliated quite extraordinarily to it. The clock that you see in the picture was the anniversary present on the 200th anniversary that Moorfields, I'm sorry, the 100th anniversary that stuck it there. This was the Moorfields waiting room a long time ago. The patients were many, they all had two eyes, and they had very few doctors. Sadly, the same story exists even now. We all seem to be overworked and looking at hundreds of patients. The cataract surgical suite at that time, and Moorfields by that time had also changed. It now has a children's hospital, which was started in 2007, and it's expecting to relocate yet again because it's outgrown its quarters. This is the Institute of Ophthalmology where the research takes place, and it's very close to Moorfields. It, uh, it's just a, an, another wing in the same hospital, and this has changed remarkably because you can see your patients and do your research all in the same building, basically. Here's another Moorfields person who invented the cry cryoprobe, Percy Amollis. We all know him because he let us defreeze and freeze the retinal cryoprobe. It also helped with cataract surgery, and the gynecologist used it too. So people who trained in these places took away things when they went away and invented things. This is, a pic this is actually a board which hangs in the director's room in um, the Government General Hospital. It lists all the superintendents who were there. And it, some of them did great things, some of them didn't do great things, some of them wished they had done great things. But nevertheless, they hang, you know, along with their counterparts who lived and ruled there for many years. And we hope that they all give us something to take away as we um, progress into the next 200 years of ophthalmology, because they did a lot of pioneering things there. And you might recognize many of these people. They have walked these halls. This is the eye hospital. The one across the hall is the old building, which is the red building you saw in the earlier picture, and the new building, which is towards the side where I'm standing. More recently, they were able to broadcast surgery and it to Moscow. So things progress. This dilapidated building is the original Elliott School building and the original red building. Sadly, it's a listed building, and there's been a lot of controversy as to who is going to rebuild it and you know, restore it. Is it going to be the archaeologists or is it going to be the eye doctors? So the debate continues. Those are the corridors which we walked in when we were students going to Elliott School to go to our lessons when we had finished our clinical work. And it's a very beautiful building. It, it is very remarkably similar to the government maternity hospital in Madras. And it's also quite similar, you know, close to the corporation building or the Ripon buildings that still exist and stand tall in Madras at this time. So we walked these corridors and we um, lived in these places. That's a picture of Duke Elder, who published those several volumes of ophthalmology that some of us are familiar with. He's still very beloved in the Reg Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, and strangely not so beloved in Moorfields where he lived and worked for a very long time. So I wanna just say that there are many things that happened out of collaborations with these places. They haven't been a lot, but we hope things will change in the future. And those are some of the things that came out of the hospital, the Madras Eye, which is a viral con conjunctivitis. The Regional Institute of Ophthalmology these days trains a lot of people. It has 30 postgraduates and a lot of MS students, and it continues to change people in surgery. In recent times, we have a lot of fellows visiting CEOs between the two hospitals, observers and trainees who cross the continents, and trainees of various kinds and consultants. Morefields published this book, uh, you know, to just to, as a historic bit, and we celebrated the 200 years. But I just want to leave you thinking that ophthalmology has been around a long time, so we do care for eyes. And although things existed in a different fashion many years ago, I'm sure the next 200 years might be quite magnificent too. Thanks.